everybody. Glad to have you with me once again on this beautiful Sunday morning. If you have your Bible handy, grab it, and let's go to Luke chapter 4. I want to begin there this morning. <clears throat> we're going to talk about some very important things as it relates to the life that we're living today in the kingdom. Title of the, title of the teaching this morning is very simply this. It's turning disharmony into harmony. And I want to look at every area of life, that which is out of harmony, and bringing it back in, into harmony the way that God designed it. So if I were to, to define disharmony, we, I guess what, that's a word we don't use a lot, but if I were to define disharmony, I would say it's the existence of anyone or anything that is contrary to the pattern, to the original design and intent of the Father. Now, let me say it again, because I want you to get this etched in your mind, because as we walk through the teaching today, we're going to contrast a lot of harmony and disharmony and look at how we can bring those things that are contrary to the pattern, to the original design and intent of the Father, bring it back into the place where it matches the pattern that God intended from the beginning. For example, sickness is disharmony. Poverty, lack, jealousy, envy, every work of the flesh that Paul lists out in Galatians chapter 5 is, is an indication that something's wrong. It's not operating that it, the way that it should be operating. Now, if I were to bring that into church language, I would say that's sin. See, we, we've, we've got a contorted idea of what sin is. We could call disharmony sin because it's missing the mark. That's what sin is. It's missing the design. It's missing the intent. It's missing the pattern, the original design of what the Father intended and the Father set up even from the beginning. So let's start this morning and let's look at an example from the life of Jesus where he said, essentially, I've come to take everything that is, that is disharmonious and bring it back into the intent and the design that the Father intended from the very beginning. So I think you're going to you're going to find this kind of interesting today. Luke chapter 4, familiar scriptures, but I think it highlights really well what Jesus said he came to do, which is to bring harmony to that which is out of harmony or disharmony. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. He says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me now, once you, I'm going to run through this list, and I know that the list is probably fairly familiar with some of you, but I want you to see how he says, he's, he's anointed me to do this. And he's going to say, here's what the harmony is, here's what the disharmony is, and I'm going to bring it back into alignment, into design, into pattern that the Father designed. So he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. That means he has a divine enablement. He has an ability, a power beyond that which is just of a natural man, to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So the, the brokenhearted and the poor are the disharmonious effects of missing the mark. So he said, here's what, he, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring good news to the poor. I'm going to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captive. Anything that is being held captive is out of the intent of the Father, so he's going to bring liberty. Recovery of sight to the blind. I think we could say that was natural and spiritual, especially spiritual blindness. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So we see right there, we got, we got seven, eight things. I didn't count them up, but there's seven, eight things that Jesus said are out of whack. And I've come to bring them back into the place where they need to be. So when you look at the words and the life of Jesus, you realize that there was nothing that was out of harmony, that was disharmonious, that did not fit the Father's original intent and design that Jesus could not correct and bring back into the original design. Jesus came to a planet that was, that was missing the mark. See, again, that's what sin is. Harmatia, missing the mark. It's, it's not drinking, smoking, going to the movies, and, and chewing tobacco. That's not sin. That can be some fruit of, of some disharmony, but it's actually not sin. Sin is missing the mark. It's missing the design, missing the intent, missing the plan, missing the purpose that God has laid out. So everything that's going on on the planet today that is, that is not the way God designed it 
is missing the mark. And Jesus came to give us the pattern, show us how to bring those things that are missing the mark back into a place where they fit the pattern. Are you with me? Maybe we could say it like this. He brought the kingdom of God to light, how the kingdom should operate, how we should live in the kingdom, principles and rules of the kingdom. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapters 5, 6, and 7, really is the constitution of the kingdom. It reveals how Jesus exposed and taught, this is how you live in the kingdom. This, this is how you treat people. This is how you treat situations. This is how you look at the cares of life. So he goes through the whole thing to show us how to bring balance back in to what God originally designed. That's the kingdom of God. He brought the kingdom so we could see it, we could believe in it, and most importantly, so we could function in it. And that's what I'm, I'm here to, this morning. This is what I want to accomplish. I want to lay out some understanding for you how to function in the kingdom. Jesus knew, no matter how insistent the adversary was, how much the killing, the stealing, and the destroying, he had the ability to reverse the killing, the stealing, and destroying. And I might just throw this in here. I'm not going to run down the rabbit trail, but I'll just toss in. When Jesus said, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes as killed to steal and to destroy. I've come that you might have life. You can see that he's, he's reversing the stealing, the killing, and the destroying with life. Now, when Jesus said that, he wasn't talking to a group of sinners. If you, if you trace back, and I think it goes back probably 10, 12, 15 verses, the whole, the whole tirade that Jesus goes through is directed toward the religious people, toward Pharisees. Jesus knew. Here's what was in the back of the mind that helped Jesus to function, to bring harmony back to that which was out of harmony or the, where there was ever disharmony. Jesus knew there was only one power, one source, one life, one creator, one sovereign God. Jesus did not approach things dualistically. He approached them out of, out of a oneness, out of oneness. And so right, right away this morning, let's get our focus with Jesus on the one power, the one source, the one life, the one creator, the one sovereign God. Paul put it like this, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 that in bodily form, Jesus contained the fullness of the Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead was in the incarnation of Jesus. He was God made flesh. And within that flesh man, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. Then in verse 10, Paul said, and you are complete in him. Now, just to make it a little bit clear, John said in John chapter 1, verse 16, he said, and of his fullness, this is pre-cross now, pre-cross. He said, of his fullness, we have all received. Jesus said something about himself, and then he passed it to the disciples. He said, and, and I probably should just read this, the, the last thing that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, in verses, let me just get back here, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20. This is what Jesus confessed about himself. And then, and then he induced the disciples with it. Watch this. Jesus came and spoke and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. So if Jesus has all authority, then there's no authority that he doesn't have, right? It doesn't leave any authority for any other source. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. No other place. So that means the devil doesn't have any authority. That means the circumstances of life have no authority. The authority, the, the um, exousia, the, the authority is not dunamis, not explosive. It's a power that you have over what you visu visually see. That's what he's talking about. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want you to see there is Jesus says about himself, all power has been given to me, therefore I give it to you and you go. What I'm trying to do to start the teaching this morning is to show you how that Jesus brought things back into harmony, then endued us with the very same ability, the same authority to go and do likewise. What, what was it that empowered Jesus that he could say, 
I have all authority. What is it that we can say? How, what was in the mind of Jesus? What was going on within him that allowed him to say that kind of statement about himself? Well, I want you to look at this. Here's, here's one of the primary things that I think really stoked the engine of Jesus. Jesus never doubted, nor should we ever doubt, where we came from, what our true nature is, what the substance is that we were created in, whose image and likeness that we bear. Those things have got to begin to, to settle within us if we're going to understand our mission, understand top priority. Jesus knew who he was, where he came from, what he was, what, what he was equipped with. And he, and he looks at us and says, I want you to have the same thing. Now, here's the confidence that Jesus spoke with. In, in John chapter 18, this is right at the end of the life of Jesus when he's being grilled by, uh, by, the, by the authorities. And he says in John chapter 18 and verse 37, he says this. Pilate said to him, are, are you a king then? Are you a king, Jesus? And he answers it directly. Now, this has to do with how Jesus saw himself. He knew where he came from, knew who sent him, knew what his mission was, walked in that confidence. He was there to, to straighten out every crooked place, to bring harmony to that which was disharmonious, right? He was there to, to bring light into darkness. He understood his mission. So he answered it straightly. And he said, you say rightly that I am a king. Can you say that about yourself this morning? See, what makes you a king is that you have the authority that Jesus has endued you with. Everything you have, you have because you're in Christ. Let me make that flat out plain. In case you have any doubts about it, everything that you possess and have and, 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 and your mission is all wrapped up in the very fact that you are in Christ. Right? You died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it's no longer I who live. It's the Christ that lives in me. And the life that I live, I, buy, I live by the faith of the Son of God, not faith in, but by his faith. So I can point to him and everything that I possess, every crooked place that he has empowered me to make straight comes because of that position that I have in Christ. Never doubt that. Never doubt it. He said, for this cause I was born. He knew his, he knew his purpose. And for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth, and everyone who is of the truth will hear my voice. He's saying, you don't hear my voice because you're not of the truth. You're not walking in that degree. You're, you're, you're walking in disharmony right now, King. And if you, were, if you were hitting the mark, you would know who I am. You'd know what my mission was. You'd know what I, I came to do. So Jesus never, nor should we ever, cut any slack to a, a religious mindset or a secular mindset that, that puts us in a place of defeat and failure at birth, coming into this life separated from God. Jesus knew his mission. There was another place, I'm just reminded as I'm teaching this morning, another place that Jesus said, uh, I think it's over in 1 John, he said, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, I'm, I'm just driving home a point that Jesus knew his purpose, knew his origination. He operated out of one source, one life, one power. He said, I, I, I've come to destroy, I've come to annihilate, I've come to render harmless, defang, run out of town, shine the light on every darkness there is. So wherever there was, was, a, was a cork, wherever there was a twist, a bend, that humanity found itself in, Jesus said, I came to undo it. Whatever you think Adam did, not going to get off into that this morning, but whatever you think Adam did, Jesus undid. Whatever crook you think Adam put into the human race, Jesus straightened it out. Whatever disharmony that Adam brought into mankind, Jesus supplied the harmony. Now it's up to us. We're beginning to learn how to walk this out in manifestation on the planet to make it on earth as it is in heaven. So what Jesus said to religion is so true today. He said, you have made the word. This is religion always starts at this place of separation. Jesus never, nor should we ever cut any slack to a religion that puts man at a place of defeat and failure when he comes into the earth. What religion taught me and what I was educated is actually believing I came 
to this planet already in disharmony with the Father. I was separated. I was missing the mark. I, I, I didn't make any choice to be that way. I had no choice. It's just the way that, that we came in, into, into life. And what Jesus said to religion is so true today. He said, guys, you have made the word of God, the word that God speaks to you, of no effect because of your traditions. All these traditions that have just been passed down to us that put us out of sorts with God, separated, sinful, totally depraved. You know, you've heard it many times in church. Jesus is saying, that's jacked up. That's not, that's not how it is. All religion that, you, that has been ground into you, that you heard confirmational biases teaching every week, same message, different title, it all assumed that you started at a place of separation and then law became the bridge or the form through which that default setting was in place to try to bridge that separation, that gap. Let me say it real plainly. You came into this world, you became indoctrinated by religion almost immediately, that you were sinful, had an endemic nature, you were apart from God, he wasn't pleased with you. And then we, we gave rules and laws and regulations to try to get us back into the favor of God. That's not, that was never the starting point with Jesus. Jesus and the Apostle Paul especially always began from a position of Christ in you. And John really picked up on what the, the attitude in the heart of Jesus in that 14th chapter of John, verse 20. He said, in that day you'll know. See, there's no separation in this. In that day you'll know that I'm in the Father and you're in me, and I'm in you, which puts the Father in you, and you in the Father, and me in you, and me in the Father, and all, all, all of us are in, in one giant, it's called perichoresis. It's in one giant circle of relationship in fellowship. He said, in that day you'd know. What is that day? That day is the day that you awakened to the redeemed reality of union. Everything begins with union with God. Everything begins with union with the Father through the Son and the Spirit. All right? Knowing who we've always been and always will be. That brings so much security. That brings so much help, so much light. Knowing you came from the image and the likeness of God and your mission as Jesus' mission was, was to bear witness to that truth. We just read it. Jesus said, yes, I'm a king and for this purpose I came, to bear witness to the truth to shine light into the darkness. In fact, uh, John chapter 1, verse 5, let me just whoop over there real quick. I'm in John. Let me back it up. John chapter 1, this is important stuff this morning because we're talking about the mission that we have, which is to bring harmony to every place that, that is not in harmony today, that has missed the mark. John chapter 1, verse 5, and the light shines in darkness. See, the darkness is the disharmony. The harmony shines into the disharmony, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The co that word comprehended is such a bad translation. What it really means is this. The darkness, the darkness could, could not um, extinguish. It could not defeat. It could not conquer the light. The light, wherever the sh light shines, darkness cannot stand. When Jesus came, he said, I am the light of the world. He looked at you and said, you're the light of the world. I'm going to make you a city that is set on a hill for all to see. See, people are turning today. People are changing their minds. They're saying by revelation, they're saying by revelation that the, the, the death-producing thoughts that religion brought to us created blindness, right? It created separation, and the world is awakening, and they're beginning to enter the kingdom. See, when you, when you enter the kingdom, you live the kingdom. There's a difference, and I want to draw a little distinction here. There's a difference between seeing the kingdom and entering the kingdom. A lot of people see the kingdom today, her teaching on the kingdom. They say, okay, I'll, I, I see the kingdom. But when you enter the kingdom, then the mission that you begin to live out is the mission that Jesus came to blaze the trail for, and you and I now are just implementing it. We're setting it in full motion. 
We're understanding that we are sons as he is son, as he was the firstborn among many brethren, and we're gaining understanding from the same infinite one source that Jesus drew from to do what he did. So we're entering the kingdom today. Kingdom's taking on absolutely new reality. Jesus chose, and we're choosing to see only what God sees and to know what he knows as he dispensed that knowledge to us. See, natural man sees as he's been taught. Natural man sees as he's been instructed. Man sees the, word, the world of good and evil that man created. See, when you look around at all the stuff that's going on today, all the junk, all the mess, God did not create that. Everything that God created was either good or very good. When you look around the world today and you see things that are, are out, of, out of sorts, you see such selfishness and such uh, little regard for human life, so much going on that, you know, it, that's just contrary to the nature of the Father. That is a crea that's creation of man. And it brings fear, it brings insecurity. Whenever we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it sets in motion man's automatic destruction, which is death. What Jesus saw, he saw as the Father sees. He, he knew as the Father knows, which is the in, eternal, unchangeable truth of man made in the beauty, the order, and the full perfection of the Creator. Isn't that good? Let me read that again to you. Jesus saw as the Father sees. Jesus knew as the Father knows, which is the eternal, unchangeable truth of man made in the beauty, the order, and the full perfection of the Creator. Jesus did not see mankind as mankind appeared. That's why Paul said we don't know anybody after the flesh. There's a, there's a shift that's going on right now. And we're starting to see like the Father sees. We're starting to see out of a, out of a position of wholeness. We're starting to see out, out, of a, out of a position of reconciliation. And that's, a, that's the position that Jesus saw. Jesus saw it. When he looked at man, he saw man in the unbroken state in which it was created by the one who is whole, who the one who is complete, and the one who is unchangeable. When Jesus looked at man, he saw him perfect. Saw him perfect. Didn't see him broken. Didn't see him separated from God. Jesus knew this. This is good. Jesus knew this, and you got to know this from the Father's eyes, that Adam could not possibly, he could not possibly reverse what the Father said was very good. He did not have that ability, did not have the authority and that power. You know how I know that? One reason I know it, this is, this is stuck with me. Since I discovered this, this changed my whole concept of Adam. Right. Jesus knew, and you got to know, that the Father looked at Adam, bumping a road maybe, but it didn't change anything about very good. It did not change man created in the image and likeness of God. In fact, this, is, this, is, this startled me when I saw this. Jesus never one time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, ever talked about Adam. Never ascribed anything, never talked about the fall. That has all been conjured up by religion, as I said earlier, to bring this separation. The Father never starts with separation. The Father, through the Son and the Spirit, starts in union. See, and that's, that's where Paul was coming from. It was the knowing that made the drastic change that we call miracles. It was, the, it was Jesus knowing that he knew that he knew where he came from, why he was here, how the Father saw creation. So Jesus brought himself into perfect alignment with what the Father saw and what the Father knew. And as we soak in that awareness, <clears throat> this is an important point, as we soak in that awareness, we're going to be able, we're going to be enabled to do what he did. I want you to soak in that awareness. If you aren't already, I want you to soak in the awareness that you, you know that you know that you know that drastic change, things we call miracles, are just a natural outworking of bringing things back into the design and the way that the Father intended from the very beginning. And when Jesus did that, he saw beyond what the masses saw, right? 
He, he knew something beyond what they knew. He saw all things as they should be. I, I so want to emphasize that this morning. We have to change the lens through which we're, which we're looking. We don't see things as they appear. We see them as they should be. Knowing this was the power of God to correct what man saw, causing man to experience what never changes, that which comes from the invisible. Everything Jesus did, he brought it from the invisible into the visible. It was the invisible that had the power, the might, and the strength to make what is visible bend its knee to what is invisible. Right, let me make just a little shift here. One of the most persistent questions I've asked myself since I've been on this grace journey since, gosh, it's been like over, well over 20 years now. The question I ask myself, and I meditate and ponder this, who was Jesus? How did Jesus live? Who was full of grace and truth? How did Jesus live? How did Jesus, who was full of grace and truth, how did he live out every day on the planet? What was his mindset? And we're, we're talking a, a lot about that this morning. Knowing that as he lived and what he did was the pattern for us too. He's the firstborn among many brothers. He's the pattern. He's the one that was cut out of the cloth, held up to, and this is the pattern that we fit. Back in the 90s, I taught on 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Never heard anybody ever teach on it before. I had no idea at that point in the 90s. I was about 10 years off from knowing what 1 John 4, 17 was actually talking about, but I taught a whole year on that. 1 John 4, 17, herein is our love made perfect. That in the day of judgment, we won't fear, because as Jesus is, so are we in this world. And I took a whole year and talked about how is Jesus, and that as he is, that's the way that we're to express it in the world. And I didn't have near the understanding, the insight, and the revelation that I have today. But if you meditate, ponder on that question, how did Jesus live? And if you should probably get your little legal pad and start writing down. How, what, how, what did Jesus demonstrate? What was his attitude, his character, his mindset? How did he deal with people? And then look at that and say, okay, this, this is the target. This is the original design and intent of the Father of which now he is empowering me to fit that same design. One thing's for doggone sure, Jesus lived in remarkable fellowship with the Father. He was always in spirit. There was no unbroken fellowship, no unbroken relationship in the mind of Jesus ever with the Father. And he said, it's needful, guys, that I leave. It's better for you that I go. Because the thing that I lived out, the thing that empowered me, the spirit of truth now, is going to come and do the same for you. He gave us the spirit of truth to guide us into all truth. To help us to be able to see those things that are out of, out of whack, out of harmony, so that we can bring them back into harmony, bring them back into kingdom alignment. The Father through the Son in the Spirit is our primary source of revelation, primary source of our understanding. And it's so imperative that to tap into that, we not see after the natural seeing of the eyes. Knowing that we have the mind of Christ, in His eyes we see through all circumstances, all situations. And that allows us, when we understand that we have the mind of Christ and we're seeing through his eyes, that allows us then to begin to see as he sees and begin to walk as he walks. So let's consider something. If, I, I hope that's made sense to you. So let's consider something this morning. How did Jesus heal the man with the withered hand in Luke chapter 6? How, how did that happen? Could Jesus not have seen it was withered? Of course he saw it was withered. He saw it with the natural eyes. He did. But you know what he did? When he looked at that man with the withered hand, he didn't give place to what he saw with his natural eyes. He saw with the eyes of his heart, with the eyes of his spirit. He saw the true picture of how the Father designed that man's hand to be whole, for that man's hand to be perfect. He saw the perfection of that man's hand in creation. So the question is, did the man's hand change? Or did the mind of creation see something different because of what it knew to be true? Did the invisible have the power to make the visible 
bow its knee to the invisible. Well, where was the power source coming from? Now, if Jesus only looked at that hand as being withered, if he only saw it with the natural eyes, he'd be like you and me. He'd be intimidated. So this, this is the one knows that's impossible. We might be able to heal a cold or a headache, but this dude with a withered hand, that's a little bit above my pay, pay grade. But I'm suggesting this morning that when Jesus looked at that withered hand, he saw the hand as it should be. He saw the withered hand as, as disharmonious. And what he saw with the eyes of his heart was the power, the ability, the authority to bring that hand back into alignment with the way that the father, father developed it. So I'm submitting to you this morning that the mind of Christ that observed caused a correction in the picture that the natural eye saw. In, in, in other words, the invisible. Man, we got to get this down. This is, this is part of kingdom living. The invisible is more powerful and is the source of everything that you see. We got to flip the script on what has our attention. That's good. That's what I'm driving at. We have to flip the script on what has our attention, what has our focus. See, when you look at your kids, for example, I know I've dealt with a lot of people over the years whose kids have had drug problems. When you look, when you look at that kid, you need to see him as he should be, not as he is. And it's so easy for the natural eye to see that kid as he is. You get discouraged, you get upset, you throw your hands up, say, I quit. And I understand that. I, I never, never had that problem with, with my girls. So I, I know some of you have faced that. I, I'm not pretending to be an expert on it, but I do know this that the reason they are not hitting the mark of where they should be, of God's design, God's intent, God's plan, is because they don't see themselves as God sees them. They see themselves as other people have formed in their opinions and, and put that on them. Maybe even mom and dad has looked at them and has, has even subconsciously looked at them askew and thought, man, you're never going to mount to anything. What is wrong with you? See, we've got to change that. When, when, you, when you see things that are not right, when you see things that are not as they should be, we don't look at that part. We look at how they should be because we understand that the invisible, I'm feeling this this morning, the invisible is more powerful than the visible. I have seen remarkable change in things when I stopped looking at them as I've always looked at them for years. It's been a process. It's been a journey for me that has, has kind of changed the way I live life. But when I finally came to the realization, well, let me, let me read it to you from Hebrews chapter 11, out of the Passion Translation. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things that we long for or the things that we desire. What, what is it you desire? See, when faith looks at it, it doesn't look at it with a natural eye. It looks at it as it should be. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. I'm sure that's how Jesus, Jesus by faith, looked at that man's withered hand, not as a withered hand, he saw it. He was highly, highly developed in this, highly developed. He didn't go through all the years of bad teaching, of, of you know, being trained to only be logical and, and look at stuff like it is and make decisions based on what we see. He didn't go through all that. You and I are deprogramming all of that stuff. But we're coming into a place where the life that we live is going to be much fuller, much more beneficial, much more abundant because of what the Spirit of Truth is revealing it to us today. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Now watch this. This third verse this is out Passion Translation. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's word. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. The invisible realm gave birth to all that that is seen. Do you know why it could do that? Because it had already been created. When God created, in six days, he created everything that would ever be needed at any time. When Peter said that you possess all things that pertain to life and godliness, it is all there. It's in the invisible realm. This man's hand was whole in the invisible realm. 
Now, as I say, listen, Jesus was highly developed. We're coming into this. We're just getting some understanding on how to function in this. In the kingdom on earth, it is in heaven, and it just depends which eyes we're seeing through. Are we seeing the kingdom of, of heaven on earth as it is in heaven? That's the question. See, we, if you're going to wait for it to be seen, to change, then you're not moving with the eyes that see the invisible, that see the way that it should be. When the creative force of change is in us, then we be, when we're convinced that this creative force is within us, we're gonna be looking to look at people, circumstances, situations, entirely different. The eyes of the heart sees through all this disharmony into perfection. The eyes of our spirit see through all of the junk, all of the garbage, clears all the dust off, and it sees, and it sees the way that it should be. This is a strong statement, and you may need to chew on this, but all disharmony is an illusion. It's not real. What's real is the way that God always intended it. That's why Paul said this. Paul said, we do not look at the things that are seen. We do not. We look at the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are temporary. This man's withered hand was temporary. The blind eyes that Jesus opened was temporary. Back to the very starting scripture that I, I read this morning from Luke chapter 4. The brokenhearted, that was temporary. The poor was temporary. The, the one that is in body, that's temporary. The, the, the acceptable year of the Lord overpowered it's called the year of Jubilee in, in the Old Testament. See, that was temporary. It, it's subject to change. And what changes it is the realm of the invisible. Now, it's an important part for you and me to see it as it should be. That's what ignites that creative process. I did a series not long ago called, it was something, I can't remember the exact title, was, was um, The Recipe for Creation, for Creating. And I walked through it, and the first part of that whole thing was, you've got to begin to see it the way you want it, not the way that it appears. And that's all predicated on the word that God speaks to you. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you made the word of God, not talking about Bible, talking about word of God speaks to you. You made it of none effect because of your traditions. My traditions made the word of God that he would show me. I would make a determination. Do I want to do this, not do it? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it doable? See, I wouldn't look at it as a completed picture. The powerful thing about the Father is he knows the end from the beginning. And he goes out to the end and he works it all the way back to the beginning so that he can assure that when it starts, it's going to end up exactly like he wants it. That's why, that's why the scripture can say it's God's, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He already said it at the end. And anything that doesn't fit the way that he saw it at the end is out of, out of sorts. It's, it's disharmonious. So you and I now are carrying on the tradition of Jesus to heal the brokenhearted, preach the gospel to the poor, set at liberty those that are oppressed, preach the year of, of Jubilee. Jesus was highly, highly developed. I, I, I just got to keep saying this. To see with the eyes of his spirit, not his natural eyes. Now, he did see with his natural eyes. Don't get me wrong. He saw, he saw what you and I see. But with the eyes that were stronger, the eyes of the invisible, the eyes of the heart, he saw it the way that it should be. Seven times. Think about this. Seven times scripture says that Jesus was moved with compassion. Compassion is love. It was an inner flow to manifest what the eyes of his heart was seeing. Every time Jesus was moved with compassion, a miracle took place. What we would call a miracle. It's not really a miracle. It's just bringing into the visible that which is invisible. It's bringing harmony into a situation that is disharmonious. That's what the miracle was. And Jesus understood that. And it's happening in you. Grace has led you into seeing people and situations differently. It's starting to stir within us, and we know that there's more to this.
And I'm not sitting here this morning teaching you, saying that I've got it all down, I, I got it all nailed, but I'll tell you what, I'm on a journey and I'm taking you with me. And we're going to come to that place where we are the measure, the stature, or the fullness of Christ. That when, when, when Paul said that in Jesus dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, we're coming to that realization. And you know what? We're just taking steps. We're, we're, we're climbing the ladder one, one rung at a time. All right, well, let's, let me just walk you through a few scriptures because our eyes are opening up. It is the the eyes open up, and I'm not talking about the you know these. I'm talking about the eyes of the spirit. We're starting to see some things, and, and the scripture is very clear about this process. Let's look at one one scripture uh, in Luke chapter 24. I'm going to run through three three passages real quick, just to lay the foundation down of our awakening, our eyes coming open. Uh, so that you, you, you'll know this. I ain't making this stuff up. It's real. And it's happening in our life now. Luke 24, verse 30. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed and broke it. I'm not going to do the background. I'm not going to go through the whole story. I just want to make a point. And he gave the bread to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. See, you really don't know him till your eyes are opened. You can have a head knowledge of him. That's not what they're talking about here. They knew him. They saw him as he was. He was revealed to them. And when they looked at him, they were becoming what they were beholding. And when, as soon as they got the revelation, he vanished from their sight. That is, that is unbelievable. But the whole point is when their eyes were open, they saw. All right, let's come over to that, to that prayer that Paul prayed in in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter one, and you know Paul got such good revelation on this stuff. Chap, uh, chapter one, verse eighteen. Let me read down through verse twenty. He said, "I'm praying this for you, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know." There again, there's that, it's that same word. No, it's it's a it's a revelation knowledge. What is the hope of the calling? What are the riches of his, the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places? So he said, I want you to see this. I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened so that you can see this vast array of revelation that's going to be placed within you so that you will function, you'll begin to live, and you'll begin to see differently than you've ever saw before. All right, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's hit verse 16, 17, and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Therefore, therefore from now on, we, we regard no one according to the flesh. It's, he's just coming at this from a different angle. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now no, we know him no longer after the flesh. We know him by revelation. We know him by spirit of truth. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So he's saying, okay, now that our eyes are opened, we're not knowing anybody after the flesh. We used to know Jesus. We saw him walking around the flesh. We don't know him that way anymore. I see you in the flesh, but I don't see you in the flesh anymore. I see you as God's perfect design. <clears throat> I see you as the fulfillment of the plan and the purpose of God. It wasn't what Jesus did that caused the healing. It was what he saw. There's power in what you see. What you see is going to come out your mouth in words. So when Jesus spoke a healing, it was based on what he saw. When the mind sees with the eyes of the heart and not the eyes of the head, our mind will never be the same. And in fact, your mind will come into alignment with what you're seeing with the eyes of your spirit. See, most of us have lived in our, our head. <laughs> we've, we've lived up here, right? And, and the Christ life and the flow comes out of here. Moved with compassion, miracles happen. How do, how, do, how, do we, how do we get from the conclusion that eternal truth that says 
that reality, that perfection as God created it to bring those corrections to the material and moral condition of the visible world. How do we get to that place? How do we get to that position? You know, I think we've been off track for a long time. The church has been way off track, hasn't helped us, hasn't taught us, hasn't instructed us, hasn't experienced it. Just hearing and agreeing in the mind does not produce much change, if any change. John declared that there must be an agreement of spirit and truth. Now, we have a lot of truth. People have, we're not, we're not bankrupt for truth. What we are bankrupt for is spirit. Seeing with spirit, living spirit, submitting to spirit, being led by, we're, we're, we're spirit bankrupt sometimes because we haven't been developed, we haven't been trained, we haven't been taught. All right. So how, how, what's, how do, what's the key? To, how, how does this come about? All right, third John chapter, third John chapter, first John chapter three, I'm sorry, first John chapter three and, and verse two. Beloved, we are God's children right now. I think that word is, I'm not sure, I think it's the word technot. It's like a teenager. We're not matured, but we're right now children. Now, that's how we see ourselves. That's the eyes. You say, well, man, my behavior doesn't, no, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters who you be. And you be a child of God right now. He, he did that. He did the job. He perfected it. He initiated it. He'll complete it. Now watch this, though. However, it is not apparent what we shall become. But we know that when, when, it is fi- when he is finally made visible, we will be just like him, for we shall see him as he is. So how does, this, how does this whole thing begin to work out in our life? How do we move into that place where we see with our, the eyes of our spirit like Jesus did? We don't look at circumstances in people. We see it, but that's not, where we're, that's not where we're focused on. We're focused on the way that it should be. He gives us the key. When he is finally made visible. See, he was made visible over here when he served them the bread and all of a sudden they saw him they recognized they knew him right when the eyes of your understanding are enlightened you'll know the hope of the calling what your inheritance what the father's inheritance in the saints are you'll know the power that raised jesus from the dead that's that's functioning in an entirely different dimension we know that when he, he is finally made visible, we'll be just like him, for we will see him as he truly is. We'll see him as he truly is, and we'll be changed into what we see. Now listen, here's, here's, here's how we make this transition. You become what you behold. It's exactly what John has got here. This is a key. Let me read it. Beloved, we are God's children right now. However, it is not yet apparent what we shall become, but we know this that when he is finally made visible, we shall be just like him. We see like he sees. We think like he thinks. We walk like he walked. We do miracles like he did miracles. For we will see him as he truly is. See, the problem is we haven't seen him as he truly is. Therefore, we don't know who we really are. You'll never know who you are until you know who he is. And you'll never know who he is except by revelation. We, we need a change in our spirit awareness, a change in our consciousness, a change in our focus. Many of us thought, man, if I could just get a truth, if I could just get a promise, isn't this the way we used to function? We'd get a promise and we would confess it over and over and over and over because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we thought the word of God was the Bible. No, that's, that's not what changes you. What changes you is the word that he speaks to you that makes him visible. And as you behold that, you are changed into the same image that you are beholding. Paul said, we we look in a mirror with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the, the glory of the Lord. And we're changed into the same image from glory to glory. See, spirit and truth. Truth which is only known in the mind changes nothing. Nothing. But it's a stepping stone. Truth has got to be intertwined with the truth giver. Union. I I love that word intertwined. Because when you are intertwined, when the spirit of truth intertwines you with the Father through the Son in the Spirit, you don't know where the Father stops and you begin. You don't know where you stop and He begins. You are functioning as one. I didn't say you are Him. You're functioning as one. That's union. 
There's going to be two big words that you're going to hear in the days that are ahead, and I'm going to get into these in the weeks that are in front of us. One is union. The other is theosis. You might go look. If, you, if you're really curious, go Google theosis. It's, 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 uh, it's divination. It's, um, it's, it's becoming God. It's a big word. It's coming. You've, you've heard some out fringes of it, and there's been some abuse of it. But their theosis is what the Eastern Church believes. It's what the church fathers taught. We're going to get into some of that. But the truth has got to be intertwined with spirit, with the truth giver himself, who is spirit. So this collaboration of spirit and truth is a work of the Holy Spirit within your life. Jesus said over in John chapter 16, verse 12, he said, guys, I got a lot of things to tell you, but you can't receive it yet. You can't handle it. But that day is coming when I will send you the spirit of truth. And as you're ready, he will reveal it. Well, we're ready today and more is being revealed today. More mysteries are being uh, un uh, unveiled, becoming uh, obvious truth to us. Like what I'm teaching this morning, it is now becoming an obvious truth that we have to see, not with our natural eyes, with our eyes of the spirit. If we're going to effect eternal change that brings harmony back into that which is that has no harmony, that is in disharmony, to bring it back into the pattern, the design, and the way that the Father created it to function. We're not going to be able to do it by natural means. It's going to come as we understand Him, behold Him, and let that revelation change us to be as He is in this present world. I know I'm talking fast. You're going to have to go back and listen to this again. I, 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 I know that. Listen, we, we can't... We can't function like we're functioning anymore. We, we, have, we have exchanged life for what is good, right? We've looked at stuff, well, not, I, it's not working, it must not be God's will, I lack faith, there must be something wrong with me. What takes place through that intimate fellowship with the Father, as you behold Him, as you behold Him, you wake up in the middle of the night, what should I do? Just think about Him. Behold him. It's changing you. When you know there is only one power, one power, one life, one source, that there's no lesser power, no matter how persistent it looks like it's standing, stop looking at it. Stop looking at it. Nor do we have to ask a greater power, beg and plead and bawl and squall and pray all night to ask a greater power to come to feed a lesser power. Those days are behind you. Your day, those days of doing that are done, right? Greater is he that is in you, that's what you behold, than he that is in the world. Stop beholding the one that is in the world and thinking the one within you is, is shrunken down and submits to the one that is in the world. Now you got it backwards. You got it backwards. Let's begin to see reality with a different set of eyes. I'm done. My time is up. I hope that I've explained this enough that you can come back. I, I didn't get all through it. I didn't get all through it. See... Sometimes in frustration, we just haven't let the Spirit work at His pace, and so we've fallen back into seeing things naturally. Those days are changing, brother. Those days are changing. And God's taking us step by step in His journey. And I got to tell you, no group of people I'd rather be on this journey with than you at the Digital Cathedral. All right? See you Wednesday night at the Secret Place at 6 p.m. Central, back next Sunday morning at the Digital Cathedral. And we're going to keep unwinding this stuff I know you never heard it taught in church, but this is a new day with a new life and a new revelation. It's new wine coming into a new wine skin, and brother, you better be flexible to handle that new wine. Don't be a brittle old wine skin that explodes and burps. Be a flexible wine skin. Keep your ears open, your eyes open of the Spirit, and let's see what all the Father's going to do in life. Amen? Amen. See you next time. If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.